I guess I would, would like to start. Excellent. Yeah. I shall go back. Um, I'd like to uh, start by really just emphasising that, that one of the first things that I learned was to listen, to watch what's happening, and also to be patient. And I think those um, are essential things about uh, um, uh, uh, that I've learned from being in Malawi. I first uh, came to um, uh, Africa when I was a medical student. I went to Sierra Leone to study Lassa fever, something I don't think you'd let a medical student uh, do um, anymore. So this is me buying bananas, uh, and you'll still find me buying bananas even uh, uh, today. Um, and then subsequently I visited many African countries, um, both in southern, uh, central, eastern and west Africa. And I learned very rapidly that clearly Africa is not a country, but is many societies, many communities um, who have some similarities, but also have many differences. And I think that's something that's not always re um, recognised, certainly in the global north, but sometimes even within the African uh, continent itself. I then, in the mid-90s, uh, after finishing my PhD, worked uh, um, at the uh, um, medical school in the University of Zimbabwe for uh, two years. And this is the uh, examiner's uh, meeting photograph here. And if you look right at the back, you can see uh, me wearing a tie, a very unusual thing uh, um, uh, for me. And in fact, you can spot uh, Theresa Elaine, who um, came on uh, uh, with me to be uh, um, head of the Department of Medicine here uh, at, uh, um, uh, uh, at the College of Medicine, then now at Kuhet. So um, uh, we left uh, um, uh, Zimbabwe uh, 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 in '96, and then I returned to Malawi in 2006 to take on the directorship of uh, MLW. Um, for those of you who haven't really um, uh, been listening to all of the, the talks so far, I just wanted to sort of emphasise um, some of the really important uh, um, components of the MLW um, uh, programme. Clearly, it's an internationally leading institution, but importantly, led by a melting pot of both Malawian and international scientists. And that has really been an important ingredient of, it, of its success. And as you heard from Henry, increasingly now, Malawians are taking leadership uh, positions within the programme, which I think is really critical for the, for the uh, ongoing su sustainability of the programme. It pursues scientific excellence, and that's at the core uh, uh, of the programme, and develops those future leaders, both uh, um, within Malawi, but then uh, also uh, beyond. And really critically, it serves uh, um, uh, the people of Malawi, but also uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa and globally, improving um, health. As I, I will tell you a, a little bit about in just a moment, the programme very much started as a hospital-based um, research programme, but increasingly it moved out from a hospital environment um, out into communities. And so now it um, uh, does research both in a clinical, laboratory environment, but also um, uh, uh, at a community uh, level. The programme, as you've heard, is very much a partnership between what was uh, the College of Medicine at Unima, but is now uh, CUHES, um, by Liverpool, which is both Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and the University of Liverpool, and Wellcome, which funds the programme, but also has put in a huge amount of effort in supporting the programme in a number of different uh, ways. And I think that partnership has really been essential to the su success um, of the programme. So what I'm going to do now is just tell you a few of the scientific but also other components that I have learnt um, uh, um, working in Malawi. As you will have heard over the last few days, the programme started off as a research project led by um, Malcolm Molyneux um, here and uh, um, uh, uh, Terry Taylor from uh, uh, um, the University of Mi Michigan. And they worked together on cerebral malaria. Now, the problem with doctors and uh, with scientists is that we use lots of jargon. And do remind me, if I use jargon you don't understand, stick your hand up and ask me to explain. But cerebral malaria is malaria of the brain. And so one of the severest manifestations um, of uh, malaria, which is obviously a common disease uh, in this country. And so um, Malcolm and Terry really put the MLW programme on the map as a centre of excellence for research 
uh, into uh, malaria. But so they began to investigate critical illness in very young children. What they soon discovered is that not everything that looked like cell malaria was indeed caused by malaria. And um, other forms of critical illness were caused by other different uh, diseases. And so they started to study those. So they started to study non-malarial uh, uh, fevers and brain infections. They started to study infections of the blood, so bloodstream infections. They started to study um, other things that cause dysfunction of the brain. So, for example, infection of the brain, meningitis. They started to study um, infections of the lung, pneumonia. And then because HIV uh, was highly prevalent, to really try to understand how HIV may be affecting these, and also the manifestations of HIV, both in children uh, and in adults. And then clearly looking at other prevalent diseases that were impacting on uh, 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 the, uh, uh, what they were seeing in hospital, and so TB um, as well. And that really w w wouldn't have been possible without establishing a robust, high-quality laboratory to underpin um, uh, um, uh, everything they were doing. And for me, it's quite, quite um, amusing to look at these uh, historical pictures because you can see here Bridget Dennis, who I think at that stage was probably um, a section head or a deputy head of the laboratory, but now heads up the laboratory. You can see Doomy here, who then um, was before she did her PhD, uh, um, again with her head in a freezer, which I think uh, probably Doomy still very, uh, very much has a head in a freezer. Um, and uh, David Nzinza, who, uh, this was before he did his PhD, but now has a PhD as a lecturer at, uh, at uh, um, MUST. And indeed, this sort of uh, process of doing the simple things well enabled research for a number of actual leaders within uh, um, uh, CUHES, or at least past leaders and, and present leaders, um, uh, including uh, 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 the Vice Chancellor himself, uh, Mac Malabo, who um, studied brain syndromes, and, uh, both related to malaria but not related to malaria. Um, Kimi Japiri, who studied malaria associated severe anemia. Victor Mopasa, who studied uh, HIV and malaria. And Benjamin Arox Chizomo and Tony, who all studied different aspects of bloodstream infection and the way that the body um, uh, uh, um, defends against those particular processes. So by doing things simple and well, that provided that bedrock for the establishment um, of the program. So the next lesson I learned was that also, when you're trying to understand a problem, you should try to address it at a cutting edge. And very rapidly, working with um, Henry Mandumba, what I discovered was that actually by collecting the appropriate specimens carefully and then applying cutting edge techniques, you could gain a fundamental understanding of disease um, uh, uh, processes. So Henry's um, uh, uh, great interest is in um, uh, TB and the cells that control TB, but also uh, um, are uh, um, a key driver of, the, of the, the lung destruction, for example, that occurs uh, with TB. And, then, and so Henry was able to um, use cutting edge techniques to understand these fundal, fundamental interactions, but then more recently has then been able to use these systems to then potentially discover drugs that will um, uh, uh, um, uh, impact on, on these processes. And that because many people have both TB and HIV, he's also studied those interactions as well at a cutting edge uh, level. The next thing that I learned is to think big and do things at scale. So watching uh, epidemiologists like Kamija Piri, like um, uh, uh, Liz Corbett, Anya Talal, Victor Mopasa, and more recently uh, 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 um, Peter McPherson, what I uh, uh, saw was that it's important to be brave if you want to ask the big questions. And I also saw that in, that, um, in addition to being uh, needing to look at large populations, that you needed to have an interdisciplinary um, approach to science. So um, I'd come from a very much laboratory and clinical research uh, uh, background, but what I saw the, was the importance of bringing in those individuals that were able to design studies effectively and process the data well, those that were able to predict what would happen given that, that data, who understand the behavioral components behind this, and then were able to manage uh, the results that, that came out.
without involving the ideas and in, involving the input of policy makers. And so that was something that very rapidly we started to do to embed um, uh, within our research. The other thing I learned was how important it was to generate a dialogue and get the input of the communities where you're doing um, the research. The, the poorest people in the world still have a right to have an input into what you do. And um, uh, soon after um, I started Malawi, we were able to appoint um, uh, Tamara Chipatsula, who is now um, uh, um, the operation manager here and is also um, uh, sort of spearheaded these uh, um, celebrations. And Tamara was one of the first health research um, community uh, engagement and involvement practitioners and really led um, our uh, move into communicating but also involving communities in, in the work that we do. And then the last thing I learned uh, from coming here and, and being in Malawi is that you can't do research well without the support of a whole range of different cadres of staff. So I'm not just talking about field workers and drivers, but I'm talking about archivists, accountants, uh, HR people, managers, all of those people without which the program would fall down without their support. And one shouldn't also forget the domestic staff who bring us coffee every morning and make sure that we stay awake during the day. So um, uh, um, it's that interdisciplinarity that, that uh, I think has been really important for the program, but also that, that I've taken forward in uh, um, my own work. So those are some of the sort of scientific things that I've learned, but I've also learned quite a lot about managing a program and about uh, uh, leadership. And I was really fortunate to work with three highly talented um, associate directors during my time here uh, in Malawi. Uh, Victor Mopasa, who's now still within uh, uh, Kuhes, Moffat Narenda, who's now uh, at the MRC unit in, uh, in Tebi in Uganda, and Wilson Mandala, who's uh, currently at uh, Must. And what I learned from them was the importance of listening and being sure that you were aware of what was going on uh, within uh, your program and within the context. Understanding context, and I don't just mean the differences between people coming from the UK and people coming from Malawi, but understanding the importance of gender, understanding the differences between urban and rural communities, understanding the differences between the elite and the very uh, uh, um, uh, poor, understanding um, uh, uh, the pressures on uh, um, uh, populations. I also came to understand the really critical importance of equity in, in ensuring that people were treated equally um, within the program and to ensure that all of the opportunities were made available to everybody, not just to a few. I mentioned uh, patients and that's, that's important. And then I think the four of us really discovered the importance for a program to have a very clear vision, to be able to um, articulate what um, uh, uh, um, uh, MLW is about and to demonstrate that it has a clear direction. And I think that's something that uh, together we were able to um, uh, generate with the input of many others um, within uh, the program. The next thing I, I learned about is the importance of equity and, and capacity strengthening. And generally, of course, capacity strengthening is a good thing but if done badly, can actually be destructive. And so it's really important to have an, a number of different components. For the processes to be transparent, and we inserted that you know, within the program very rapidly. I mentioned equity before, but making sure that um, the opportunities are equal, equally available to everybody within the program, not just the scientists, but also the, the, the support staff. To ensure that what you don't do is train somebody and then um, drop them so that they can't further advance. So, as an example, somebody who has a PhD then has a long way to travel in order to become a group leader. So it's really important to provide that um, post-PhD uh, support, for example. As I mentioned, it's also important to provide those opportunities for um, support staff. Many of the people who currently underpin the research that we do have benefited from the, the, um, uh, uh, um, the capacity strengthening opportunities that are available in the program and uh, as I, uh, what, what has been exciting is to see how that, that continues within the program. I think it's important to make sure that there are the linkages with um, uh, partners and particularly our host institutions, um, both uh, um, uh, CUES but also 
um, uh, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital to ensure that they are also benefiting um, from um, our activities. So those are some of the things that I've learned from Malawi and so what I thought I would do is just uh, tell you a little bit about how that has sort of impacted on the science that we um, uh, have, have done. And um, for us to continue the science, I've, I've really been very grateful to the program to allow me to continue to work and have research uh, uh, um, uh, projects within uh, the program. And I've very much enjoyed this time after being director, continuing to work with many people uh, uh, within the program. So the focus, focus of much of our research has been um, pneumococcal disease. Um, caused by a bug called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, the pneumococcus causes a number of common diseases. The, the major burden is pneumonia, so infection of the lung. It also causes um, infection of the blood, so bloodstream infection or bacteremia, and it also causes meningitis or uh, uh, infection of the brain. And it particularly affects vulnerable people, so very young children, older adults, and people who have problems with the immune system, including people with HIV. So it's estimated that over 3 million uh, uh, children die annually from either pneumonia, bacteremia, or meningitis caused by streptococcus pneumonia, by, caused by uh, this uh, bug. And as I mentioned, um, uh, this is a bug that um, uh, its sort of biggest cause is of pneumonia. This is a drawing that was on the wall, actually, of a school in Uganda. Um, for those of you who are anatomically astute, you'll notice there are a few mistakes on this diagram, but um, I won't point those out now. Um, so, it's all very well saying um, pneumonia is important globally, but is it important for Malawi? Because clearly, if we're going to set up a, um, a series of research projects, we need to be sure that things are important for Malawi. And this is WHO data, which will be based on data from around the time when we started. Uh, uh, some of these uh, um, uh, research projects I'm going to describe. And as you can see, this is the sort of ranking for different causes uh, uh, of death amongst children under five, and pneumonia ranks number one. And then if you take data that's come out of the electronic patient record system uh, spine that we uh, collected and all admissions to uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, which is the largest uh, um, uh, tertiary referral centre in Malawi and has a very large intake of, of patients, you can see that, beyond, uh, that after TB, pneumonia was the commonest cause uh, of admission when this data was collected heavily affected by um, uh, HIV at the time, although I recognise that things um, are changing. So pneumonia is important to both adults and kids in malaria. These are diseases that are caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, the bug that we've been uh, studying in the last uh, uh, few years. So the, 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 the bug streptococcus pneumoniae lives at the back of the nose. Um, it in uh, children in many African countries, um, 100%, so all children will be colonised by this bug at the back of their nose in the first year of life. So the so-called force of infection in many African societies is very high. It's lower in richer uh, uh, settings. The bug lives at the back of the nose and lives with many different other bacteria, viruses and fungi and it's in competition both with its brothers and sisters, so other types of pneumococci, but also with bacteria, fungi, and viruses. And um, uh, what, it is, what is it's adapting to do is to be able to live at the back of the nose and then be transmitted from person to person. It's not a distinct advantage for the bug to cause life-threatening disease or to kill its host because it won't, then won't be transmitted onwards. But as a consequence, uh, uh, um, of it living at the back of the nose, it does cause disease, though not in, not in most people. So it lives at the back of the nose, but may get to the lung to cause pneumonia or lung infection. It may get into the blood to cause bloodstream infection or bacteremia. From there, it may get to the brain. Occasionally, it may get to the lungs, although usually it goes from the lungs uh, um, to the blood. But if it gets to the brain, it causes um, uh, meningitis. This is a um, scanning electron micrograph of the, um, uh, the pneumococcus. They're blown up very, very high. You can't see them by the, the naked eye. It's been false colored, but you can see two characteristics about the bug. First of all, you usually have two bugs together, so so-called uh, diplococcus, 
and it often forms chains. The other characteristic about it is it has a thick outer coat, which is called a capsule, which protects the bug from drying and protects it from uh, um, attack by the body's immune defences. So it has this capsule that protects it from uh, immunity. There are more than a hundred different types of capsule, which presents quite a challenge because the capsule is uh, um, the, the basis of all of the available vaccines um, uh, are currently used at the moment. But fortunately, it's only a limited number of the so-called serotypes that cause uh, uh, disease, although they are changing um, uh, all the time. And so current vaccines either target either 10 or 13 of these 100 uh, serotypes. But it's a complex process. And these vaccines have been deployed um, throughout the world. This is a, a, a map uh, generated by um, the John Hopkins uh, uh, unit showing where the vaccine has been uh, deployed across the world and pretty much throughout the African continent um, the vaccine is, is being used. Notably, China has not um, deployed it soon. There is variation in vaccine uptake in many different countries. But I think the one thing that Malawi has to be proud of is al although it's one of the poorest countries of the world, it's been a world leader in vaccine deployment. It's often been the first country on the continent to use a vaccine. It's, a, it's an early uh, um, uh, uptaker of vaccines and it has a very high vaccine uptake compared to many other uh, countries. And so it's been able to, to deploy these uh, vaccines or these tools very, very um, effectively. So the, the question that we sort of set out to address is, um, are these vaccines, when deployed, um, effective in Malawi? And can, they, and can we sorry, improve on their impact? The vaccine, the PCV13 vaccine, was introduced in Malawi in November 2011. And it was deployed in what's called a 3 plus 0 schedule, which means that the three vaccine doses are all given early on in life. So it's um, 6, 10, and at 14 weeks of age. So very, very um, early in life. And clearly, um, going back to my comment that African, Africa is not a country, it's important to generate local data because the other countries that were generating data at the same time as us, Kenya, um, uh, the Gambia, South Africa, uh, uh, and elsewhere, all have their differences in terms of population growth, life expectancy, HIV seroprevalence. So it's important to generate that data. And we've generated a series of studies, um, uh, primarily based in, in Blantyre, but also in other welcome-funded uh, programs in Ilongwe, in Nchinji, and in the far north in Koronga, where Neil French was based uh, for a number of uh, years. So the first piece of data that we um, uh, uh, generated in this, in this uh, uh, realm was um, taking the um, blood culture surveillance, so the bloodstream infection surveillance and meningitis surveillance that Malcolm had uh, initiated and then was continued on by many others within uh, uh, the program to look at what the, the effect was on uh, bloodstream infection and meningitis since the introduction of the, of the vaccine. And amazingly, we had over 10 million person years of observation. So we had a huge amount of data over 140,000 blood cultures, over 63,000 CSF cultures uh, to look at. And what these graphs are are different um, uh, 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 age groups, so all using the same uh, um, uh, uh, axes, looking at the amount of disease, so the instance of disease um, occurring uh, by time, and then uh, um, uh, uh, occurring by time along the bottom. And the red line is when the vaccine was introduced. So pneumococcal disease was going down before the vaccine was introduced. And that was, we don't know for sure, but likely because of improved nutrition, improved socioeconomic circumstance uh, in very small amounts, um, reductions in malaria in some areas, um, obviously reductions in HIV prevalence and better control uh, of, of HIV, many different factors that were already um, uh, enabling the decrease of, of pneumococcal uh, disease. These graphs are of the total amount of pneumococcal disease and then the disease attributable to vaccine and not attributable uh, uh, to vaccine. And then it was a very complicated process to try to unravel how much was happening already and how much was triggered by um, uh, 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 vaccines. 
Now, the epidemiologists in the audience will all now be um, itching to tell me what the best approach is to analyse this data. As you might imagine, we had many, many, many different discussions about how to do this. I'm not going to bore you with the techniques. Um, I'm happy to discuss them afterwards, but I may have to defer because I don't ne necessarily understand all of the maths that, behind, that lie behind this. But we use uh, t multiple different methods of neg negative binomial regression. And essentially what this showed us was that the vaccine was certainly protecting those who were directly immunized. So it was protecting um, those children uh, 1 to 4 and those children uh, 5 to 14. And there was some uh, uh, evidence that it was providing also some protection to those that weren't immunized, but certainly not as much protection as had been seen in Richard's settings, and particularly not in um, older or much older children and adults. In, in uh, countries like the UK, a number of European countries and the US, what these vaccines had done is protected individuals but also protected vulnerable populations, particularly the elderly. And actually their biggest effect uh, uh, in, um, uh, was on uh, the elderly. So th what we weren't seeing was strong evidence of herd immunity indirect protection. We could see direct protection but not um, uh, um, indirect protection. And for those of you who are not familiar with herd immunity, I thought I would just sort of pause and just explain it um, in very simple terms. Just to quickly say that um, although many people use vaccinated and immunised inter interchangeably, it's important to remember that vaccinated simply means you've received the vaccine, but immunised implies that you've received the vaccine and are, have some protection uh, from the vaccine. So the yellow individuals are those individuals that are immunised, the blue individuals are those that are not immunised, and the red individuals are those with disease. And if you have low vaccine coverage, then obviously you will get some individual protection for those who actually get the vaccine, but those um, with disease are able to spread it to those who are unprotected, and it uh, um, is able to spread through a community. But as you drive up the number of people that are immunised, so are protected, you reduce the amount of transmission within a, a, a population. And so you protect those that are susceptible, so they are unimmunised, but uh, um, uh, those that are infected, those few left and infected, aren't able to reach them and give them uh, the uh, infection. So that's herd immunity. And many of you will have seen it um, um, amongst cows who protect their young, amongst wildlife that uh, um, protect their young. It's, a, it's an instinctive uh, process, but here we're using vaccines to protect the herd as well as the um, individual. Before I talk about how we, we try to address how we might improve that herd immunity, the one thing I would like to mention is that these vaccines have really quite um, broad-ranging um, uh, effects. And this is really the brainchild of Neil French, who had the idea that what we should be doing is also looking at not just the direct effect of vaccines or the herd immune effect of vaccines, but also on whether they're affecting all cause mortality. If you reduce the amount of pneumonia in a population, do you also um, uh, make the population fitter, more able to um, uh, uh, um, resist other infections or other uh, um, uh, insults, and so actually uh, improve um, uh, uh, the population uh, health. So alongside um, the introduction of the um, pneumococcal vaccine, the rotavirus or uh, the vaccine that prevents diarrhea was also introduced. And what we were able to see is that um, in addition to preventing, for example, diarrheal deaths within uh, um, uh, the community, the introduction of rotavirus together with the pneumococcal vaccine reduced all-cause mortality. So these vaccines have broad-ranging effects way beyond having those direct effects uh, uh, on the disease um, itself. So to study why we're not getting the same degree of herd immunity that we um, uh, had seen in uh, uh, richer settings, we set about um, uh, uh, establishing a series of uh, um, carriage surveillance studies. Remember, this bug is capped uh, uh, is carried in the back of the nose and in small children is carried in the back of the nose at very um, high levels. So you can see that in our carriage surveys 
in children three to seven years of age, if you um, um, look at the types that are protected by the vaccine and the types that are not protected by the vaccine, you're talking about 80% carriage rates, so very high carriage rates of the pneumococcus. And in this, within this vaccinated population, um, there almost certainly was a drop in the amount of uh, uh, carried pneumococci that should be protected by the vaccine in that vaccine type, serotype carriage, was about 28% before PCV was introduced and dropped down to between 20 and 17%. But you can see that we never got down to very low levels. And you need to get down to those low levels to interrupt person-to-person -person spread and get that herd immunity that you require. Some of you whom will have received vaccine, some of whom won't have received a vaccine. But again, it never fell down to the levels where you would hope that you would uh, reduce transmission, and particularly transmission uh, to vulnerable um, uh, populations. And that was work that was led by Todd Swarthold and Tandy Wolokomo, who's here at uh, um, uh, Kuhers. So having seen that we are not controlling carriage, we wondered why that was. And the way that we addressed this was to make use of a very large study that was being led by uh, Melita Gordon at the time, which was looking at typhoid um, uh, immunity within the population. Unfortunately, because I was part of the, um, uh, 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 of the study group that, that uh, Melita led, I was able to persuade the group to let us have samples of those here that were collected at random from the population. And what we were able to do there, working in collaboration with David Goldblatt's lab at UCL in, in London, is to look at the um, antibody profile. So antibodies are the part of the blood system that protects, um, uh, uh, or part of the, the, the system that protects against uh, infection. So we can look at the antibodies in the blood that were induced by a vaccine. Now this looks like a very complicated graph, but it's actually quite uh, uh, simple. This is the level of antibody to one particular type of pneumococcus, 23F. This is age up to uh, 60. These dots that you can see in the background are individual blood samples from the people that were um, sampled as part of those uh, surveys. What you can see is the average a line, which is a, a, a spline line, goes up, goes down, and goes up again. And the reason it goes up really is because these infants were receiving vaccine. This is their vaccine-inducing uh, uh, immunity, which is, which is fine. This red line represents the um, a, a, a postulated level of antibody that's required to, c to control uh, carriage. This brownish line is the line that represents the, the threshold by which you've got to get over in order to stop uh, the bug getting into the blood or into the brain. And what you can see is with vaccine, with this particular serotype, we got up to levels that were beyond the levels that were required to protect against carriage and uh, um, uh, invasive disease. So that was good. But what was a characteristic of most or uh, almost all of the serotypes is that there was a then a rapid decline in this antibody to thresholds below um, uh, uh, the, the uh, so-called correlates of protection. It started to go up again, and that was due to natural exposure within the community boosting um, uh, um, immunity. But there is this period of vulnerability which might explain why we were not getting good control of carriage and therefore not good control of disease um, within uh, these populations. This data has just recently um, uh, been published. So we had data that the vaccine was working well in protecting the individual. We had data that showed that although that was happening, it's likely that we weren't inducing the amount of herd immunity that was, re that was required to truly control uh, pneumococcal disease. And we also had data that suggests that the current protocol, the current schedule that we're using vaccines in, may not be optimal for getting good control of pneumococcal disease. So to address this, working with uh, uh, the Malawi Ministry of Health, what we've embarked on, and this is work that's been led by Todd Swarthold and, and now by Aku Kalazingoma, um, who did his PhD uh, with us in UCL and has now come back to uh, Malawi, is to actually, across the whole of Blantyre, evaluate in a randomised way, a, randomized, a cluster randomised way, the typical schedule for um, uh, Malawi, which is three doses of vaccine given uh, early on in life, to a so-called two plus one schedule, where we've moved the last dose on until nine months. So we try to extend the protection that the vaccines give to older kids, and therefore control pneumococcal infection. 
that study is ongoing, it's going extremely well, and we hope to report to that very soon. And this will inf inform ministry policy about what they do with access schedules to try to control uh, um, pneumococcal disease. What's been exciting about this work that we've been doing is that there have been spin-outs um, of a huge number of projects in different uh, directions. So um, we've uh, established a project which has been led by Brenda Kawana Adams, who was based at UCL, has now come to uh, join the MLW uh, program, which is protecting very, which is aimed at protecting very young infants, so so-called cocooning. We've been studying pneumococcal carriage in adults living with HIV, and this is work that's led by Des Timberler and Tandy Monokomo. We've been looking at the genetics or the genes of the bacteria that cause pneumococcal disease, and this is work led by Andrea Gori and uh, Crispin Chaguza. And then we've been studying antimicrobial resistance and the worry that some of these uh, bugs that cause pneumonia may become increasingly antimicrobial resistant. And that's work led by um, Aku uh, Kalizangoma and David uh, Singleton. We've also turned our surveillance and vaccine evaluation skills to um, uh, COVID-19, and that's work led by uh, Kondwani Jambo, Latif, Donny, and, and Steve. And we've also used this as a platform for generating a program that started to involve the community in um, addressing some of that um, uh, vaccine hesitancy to get better vaccine confidence within that this environment and to generate a dialogue around the community protection that vaccines can produce. And this is work um, uh, primarily led by Roderick uh, uh, Simkabusi. Um, and Roderick, all the way through the, the um, COVID pandemic, has been working with community groups to generate um, cartoons and um, uh, animations that tell a story that engages conversation around vaccines and a conversation how, about has, how best to use vaccines to protect um, communities. And if you want to hear more about that, there's a whole afternoon devoted to netball and vaccines tomorrow afternoon, so you're very uh, um, welcome. To uh, touch on in the next just a uh, few minutes, uh, could, because what I've sh shown you, I think, is using or, or uh, doing the simple things well, and I think what I've also shown you is doing things at scale is really important. But then the last um, facet that I talked about that, that um, Henry uh, really introduced me to is collecting the right samples and doing um, things at the cutting edge. And this work was really enabled because of a research program established by Stephen Gordon back in Liverpool that was then taken over by Daniela Ferreira. But Stephen has now established it here in um, uh, Malawi under the Marvels program, which is really understanding that carriage process that pneumococcal, pneumococcus undertakes and then how to control that with vaccines. And what we've been able to do is to study the pneumococcus at that um, the surface at the back of the nose by taking samples from um, these healthy volunteers. And just to orientate you a little bit, this is the sort of carpet itself that we are able to um, obtain that line the surface of, of the nose. So what we've been able to uh, show taking those samples is that the bug doesn't just live on the surface of the nose, but actually gets into the cells in the nose and actually crosses through the nose, even in healthy individuals. So even when the bug actually starts to cross human barriers, that doesn't necessarily translate into disease. And that's an important um, uh, uh, new finding that's enabled to understand this carriage process. And we then started to take that into the laboratory using a number of different cell systems to understand the genetics behind it, how this is controlled, um, the uh, um, immunological uh, processes um, uh, um, that underlie carriage, and then how to best um, uh, control it at a population level, ultimately. One of the things that we've been doing is looking in these cell systems at what happens at the surface, likely in the nose. If you remember, just um, a, a while ago, I showed you a scanning EM of the pneumococcus. These are pneumococci here. But what we discovered is that these pneumococci, which people used to think only sat outside the cells, actually start to go inside the cells. You can see this ruffle here with the pneumococcus going into the cell. And then if you have a look here, you can see the pneumococcus under the cell surface. It almost looks like it's lying under a blanket, doesn't it? And so it, this, is the, this is the bug underneath the surface. This is, these are images generated by uh, Caroline Waite in, in our uh, group. And 
Then using much more complex systems, so these are primary epithelial cells with multiple different cell types. These are the, in the non-infective uh, infected culture, these are um, the sort of hair-like uh, cilia that are on the surface of the, the epithelium. And then it, with these red circles, these are around little globs of mucus being uh, generated by the goblet cells um, uh, on the epithelial surface. And then when you introduce pneumococcus into these cultures, and you can see the diplococci in the yellow circles and even a pneumococcal uh, chain here, is you suddenly get big globules of mucus being produced. Now, I'm, I'm really sorry, I mean, to, to say this in the Vice Chancellor's um, um, presence, but you know what this is, don't you? This is snot. <laughs> and we all know what snot is. Um, so what's happening is, is that pneumococcus is inducing inflammation. And the reason that's important is that, you know, what happens when you have snot? You wipe your nose. And what happens when a three-year-old wipes their, wipes their nose with their hand? They then wipe it on their parent, on their other siblings, don't they? And that helps us to start to understand how this process um, of, of transmission and colonisation um, occurs. I could talk about all of this uh, for many, many more hours, but I think I really need to um, uh, stop. Just self to say that by doing things uh, carefully, collecting the right uh, samples, we've really been able to understand some of the mechanisms of carriage, which will then inform the way that we do some of our studies at a, um, uh, at a population level. And a number of these techniques have now been taken on by uh, Kondwani ja Kondwani Jambo's uh, group, and, um, uh, and so he's able to do similar studies. Um, here in Malawi. So what have I learnt uh, from Malawi? Well clearly the importance of leadership and that's not just leadership by the directors, this is leadership by every member of the MLW community. It's really the community that drives MLW not just the person um, at the top. The importance of equity and making sure that everybody benefits uh, by this process. Keeping things simple as, as uh, Malcolm and Terry set out right from the beginning using cutting-edge technologies to understand the process. And I don't just mean the sort of microscope things that I said, but also cutting-edge epidemiological and behavioural uh, tools, doing things at large scale. But the most important thing is to have fun. And I think we demonstrated that this morning, that it is really important to have fun because it is that that builds the community that then drives that um, excellent science. So I hope that I've painted a picture of the sort of things that I've learned um, from my time in Malawi. These are pictures drawn by the women of Chukwawa during a, um, an artist in residence uh, program some uh, uh, years ago, um, uh, um, depicting their lives and uh, the, 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 the way that uh, uh, um, uh, science impacts on, on uh, uh, um, uh, what, what people do and what people experience. I started to put together an acknowledgement slide. It then became two slides, it then became three slides, it then became four slides. So I'm really sorry, but I don't have an acknowledgement slide. If I had not mentioned people here, I'm really sorry. I, um, there are many people that have really um, helped me and helped the programme to move forward that I haven't uh, mentioned. There are just a few people that I just would like to, to mention those, and those are really the institutional leaders in the partnership that we've been uh, uh, talking about. So it's the um, uh, principals of the College of uh, uh, Medicine, Kemaleta and Mwatsa Mupando, and then uh, um, the uh, Vice-Chancellor of Kues, who have really enabled the program uh, to move forward. It's the um, uh, um, uh, leaders within the University of Liverpool, Peter Wynne Stanley, um, uh, Neil French uh, and, and, and many others. And then particularly uh, uh, for me at uh, the School of Tropical Medicine is that long-standing friendship that David Lou has been able to uh, um, uh, provide for me and that support which has been uh, fabulous uh, over the years and of course Jan Janet Hemingway who employed me in the first place. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>